Good evening, Central Indiana. Oh, man, I messed that up. Central Indiana, welcome to Porch Time, live from JTH Construction Studio. We have a fabulous show lined up, and we have lots of speakers in here tonight, but I'm going to turn it over and sh and turn it over to Valida and Bethany. And my job is done here, because uh, this, this is big for both of them, Valida. Take it away, dear. Well, thank you, Kevin, for letting us um, have this event. We are celebrating 200 years of Morgan County and Martinsville. And this is part of the bicentennial uh, celebration for Morgan County and Martinsville. And we are here tonight doing part of the Mem Morgan County Memories Project, which before we get started, I would like to um, give Susan Tomlinson a shout out. Um, she's got some health issues and can't be here, but it's because of her that we're doing this project and she's been responsible to get the whole thing going and off. And it's been a great experience for me. I've got to do some of the interviews. I've got to interview Paul, which was great for me. And um, it's just been a good experience. And I still got a lot of people I want to interview, but we're getting three of them in here tonight. So we're here and Bethany's going to introduce our guest. You mind if I ask a question real quick? Mm -hmm. Go ahead. So you guys are asking people in the county to also do interviews on their own. Is that right? Right. So how does that work? Well, Vicki Kibbett will tell you, if you have a phone now, if you have a phone, then you can record. And there's, anytime there's a holiday or any kind of get-together, family get-together, she's encouraging everybody to take that phone and interview your grandma, interview your mom, your dad, your grandpa. They all have a story. We all have a story. And someday people will forget those stories. But with the Memory Project, you can always go back and listen to those and see where we came from. Yeah. Okay. So for, you want me to go ahead and get started sure. here? All right. So I'm going to read off some intros here for these three gentlemen. And then Valida and I are going to gonna get up out of here and, and um, let... Kenny Hale and Don Adams come sit down and, and interview these fine folks. All right. So first up, we have Paul, or better known as Moose Mason. And Paul is a man committed to serving his country and community. He was an Army veteran drafted at the age of 18. He proudly served his country in Korea. Paul is best known for the years he served as Morgan County's sheriff, but he started out as a small business owner in Mooresville. He was later hired as a dispatcher for the Mooresville Police Department and quickly moved from that position to Deputy Marshal. In 1963, Paul applied for a Morgan County Sheriff's Deputy position and was hired. He served in that capacity until Sheriff Fred Neal's term was up and decided to throw his hat into the political ring. Paul was elected Sheriff in 1970 and served eight years, followed by four years as County Clerk and back to Sheriff for four more. Not finished yet, he ran for and was elected to the county council where he served two consecutive terms. Paul was also a devoted family man. He and his wife, Carolyn, were married 58 years. They had two children, Debbie and Butch, three grandsons, six great-grandchildren, and one, great, one step-great-grandson. When asked how he would be remembered, Paul said, I'd like to be remembered as a good sheriff who tried to do the best for his community. All right. Next, we have James or Jim Harris. The po political career of Jim Harris began on March 20th, 1970. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> the, po the political career of Jim Harris began on March 20th, 1970, when he announced his candidacy <clears throat> for prosecuting attorney of Morgan County. The change of career followed his resignation as Indiana State Police Officer after 11 and a half years, the last five of which he was his assignment to the State Police Crime Laboratory in Indianapolis. He attended the evening division of the Indiana University Indianapolis Law School while assigned to the crime lab. Elected as prosecuting attorney in November 1970 and re-elected in 1974, he served until January 1975 when he was appointed the first judge of the Morgan County Court. He was elected judge of the Morgan County Superior Court in 1978 and judge of the Morgan Circuit Court in 1982. Making decisions in your own life 
is stressful and making decisions and making lifetime of decisions which impact the lives of other people is even more stressful. Jim advised me that one of his favorite Bible verses is Micah 6, 8, which states, What does the <clears throat> Lord require of you, O man, ju but to act justly and to love mercy, mercy and to walk humbly with your God? It is this resilience on faith that made the burden of finding and dispensing justice more possible. Judge Harris retired as a full-time judge in 1999 and served as a part-time senior judge in various counties in South Central Indiana for 12 years until 2011. He lives in Mooresville with his wife, Carolyn. They have two sons, five grandchildren, and two great-grandchildren. They will be married 68 years on June 8th. What? 65. 65. What did I say? 68. That's 60. okay. <laughs> he doesn't want to be older. <laughs> 65 years on June 8th. I'm sorry. Then we have Phil Deckard Sr. Phil Deckard served in the United States Air Force Strategic Air Command Wing five and a half years. He was honorably discharged in 1963. He entered politics when he was first when he first filed as delegate to the Republican State Convention in 1968 and has been selected continuously since that date. He started working as Morgan County Representative for Senator Richard G. Luger when he first announced his candidacy. In 1970, he filed for clerk of Morgan County and was elected the youngest clerk in Indiana. He served in that position for two consecutive terms. In 1979, he was elected as Morgan County Assessor and served in that position for three consecutive terms and then filed for mayor of the city of Martinsville and was elected in 1988, where he served as mayor for four terms, 16 years. Phil is currently serving as a Martinsville city councilman and has held four political offices and served in Morgan County and Martinsville politics for the past 50 years in some capacity. All right. Wow, that makes me tired just listening Ooh. to all of what I they've know. done. Don't it? Right? Uh, that's great. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you, sir. Now, I think the ladies are going to step away. Yes. Mm -hmm. All right. Don and Kenny are going to come in and start firing questions off. Okay. Beth, you want to take your phone? Sure. And we'll line them up on the camera. Thank you. Like we did. Okay. Those two are better looking. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, that's the way it is, Paul. Yeah. <laughs> you might need to move Kenny down or move it down like a way, or this way a little further. Kenny might have to move toward Don. Oh, you can tell oh, Don me Adam and Kenny Hell will be asking get, questions. Gonna have to get, close and come. get chummy. Yep. We are chummy. Right. Let me. I'm going to move your mic just a little bit closer to you. There we go. All right. Go ahead, gentlemen. Oh, I kick it off? Yep. Well, first question, gentlemen, is. Um, are you a Morgan County native? I'll start with Paul. Are you from Morgan County? Well, kind of. <laughs> <laughs> I was about nine years old when we moved here. I was born in Lynn's Valley, but we moved down Morgan County on Smoky Road, and I was nine years old. For the most part of my life, I've been in Morgan County. That's a pretty good life. I'm glad to have you here. How about you, Mr. Mayor? I came to Martinsville in 1963. I am a Monroe County native, neighbor to Morgan County, and uh, soon learned that unless you were born here, you were not a native, but I think I proved that wrong. We became accepted very well, yeah. and uh, we're happy with Morgan County. There are a lot of Deckards still down in Monroe County. There are Deckards and Ragweeds. Uh, pretty well covered. <clears throat> Jim? Judge? No, I'm not a Morgan County native, if that means you were born here. But um, I was born in um, Indianapolis on the west side, lived on the west side and south side, uh, actually until graduated from high school. But in that period of time, my dad had bought 20 acres south of Monrovia and north of Martinville um, at a time when you could buy 20 acres and a barn and a little pond for $100 an acre. <laughs> and, um, it was on a shoestring, so to speak, and we spent a lot of weekends here in Morgan County where he was attempting to put up a house. And then um, when I was in the eighth grade, which was 1949 and 50, uh, we moved down here, and I went to elementary school at Sheridan, 
and then the first 12 weeks of high school. And things weren't going so well from the standpoint of finishing the house. So we moved back to Indianapolis, and um, I spent a lot of weekends down here uh, in the time I was in high school. And then literally the day I graduated from high school, I moved to Morgan County full time because mom and dad had moved down here maybe a month before that. Thank you. Penny? Um, how did you meet your wife? We'll start with Paul on that. The what? Meet, meet your wife. Oh, <laughs> uh, well, I uh, got back from Korea. I hadn't had ice cream in about a year. <laughs> the old Dairy Queen there in Mooresville, I frequent quite often. And I met Carolyn there, I asked her for a date, and the rest is history. How many years were you married, Paul? <clears throat> She was married 58 years when she yeah. passed away, and that's been 10 years, 10 years ago. Jim, I'm going to throw it to you. How did you meet your wife? Well, I kind of went over some of these questions uh, earlier this uh -oh. with my wife. <laughs> because, <laughs> because when you're thinking back 50 years or more, uh, you know it's a little hard to remember the details. And she told me that as far as I was concerned, it was divine intervention. <laughs> because I was so fortunate to have her. But, um, and I would agree with that part. It's the best decision, and I've made a lot of them in my life as judge. The best decision I've ever made is marrying Carolyn Burke. Yeah. And, um, but, I, but actually, she worked at a little restaurant, the ENF uh, truck stop or restaurant or cafe or whatever it is, which was. At, at the bottom of Brooklyn Hill in 67, just north of the drive-in. And then later on, they sold that restaurant, and they had a restaurant down on the north edge of Peregrine on 67. But Carolyn was uh, in high school and working as a waitress there. That's where I first met. And you guys have been married 65 years, if 65 I remember? 65 years come yep. June the 8th. June the 8th. Phil, how'd you meet your wife? Met my wife uh, as a classmate at Bloomington High School uh, against her mother's wishes. Uh, <laughs> she warned her against those Decker boys, her reputation, but <clears throat> her mother since uh, became a lifelong friend of mine and uh, advocate and protector, and uh, we've been married happily 65 years. Well, on the kind of a, we'll start, you, start you, you Phil, uh, on the 65 years, I know uh, we've got, Phil, too, sitting over here, but um, who else have we got in the family? Well, we have... Uh, grandchildren, uh, too. So, uh, okay. We have uh, four children, uh, one of which we lost two years ago, uh, and we're blessed with five grandchildren, and we have 11 great-grandchildren. Oh, and let me be quick to correct. I said 65 years. That will be this September, uh, 64 and counting, and holding, I should say. <laughs> Thank you. Paul? Yes, sir. You have uh, two children, yes. But uh, what was what's the grandchildren and the great grandchildren and three, maybe even a great great three grandsons and uh, six great grandchildren and one two step great grandchildren. Yes, that's got it. Pretty good. And Jim, I know uh, I actually had a couple boys in my scout troop had your name. <laughs> yeah, probably at one time, Don. Um, I have two sons. Uh, David and Randy. Uh, Randy lives up in Muncie, the school administrator in Connorsville, and David has worked for a construction company for many years, and is a construction foreman. Uh, I have five grandchildren and two great grandchildren. Thank you. Bill, what was the atmosphere like back in 1970 whenever you decided to run? You know, uh, <clears throat> I'm not so sure that I could comment on that. The atmosphere was pretty much uh, what I considered normal at that time. It was normal to our expectations and customs. Uh, I don't remember too many turmoils going on. Um, it was just uh, open, I think, to most anyone, anything, and we just adapted accordingly to the situation at hand. Uh, certainly nothing like the situation we're facing today, thank God, um, but um, life was good. Very good. Jim, I'm going to ask you the same question, sir. Uh, my recollection of 1970, was, it was just an average year. There was nothing monumental about it and nothing happening. 
things were a lot slower than now, but it was just, just an average year. Moose, can you add anything to that? Oh, I don't I don't remember too much about it. I was too busy trying to become sheriff. <laughs> <laughs> I can totally understand that. <laughs> yes. Kind of let you have it again. What about um uh, what caused you to get involved in politics? And I suppose everybody's got a little different story on that. Uh, Jim, what? Well, uh, my, I know you. Go ahead. My getting into politics really had nothing to do with politics, <laughs> except that if you had to get into politics to be prosecuting attorney. Uh, I had to resign from the Indiana State Police because that was a law at the time in order to run for prosecutor. So. I had two sons and a wife, no job as a practical matter. <laughs> but um, uh, the reason I got into politics was to be prosecuting attorney. It was a good job. We were lucky enough to win uh, both the primary and then the general election. But uh, that was what got me into it. Phil, how about you? What, uh, what got you kicking? I think probably uh, my association with the radio station of which we started uh, back in 67, uh, get, getting acquainted with some of the uh, uh, political figures in our county as well as state, uh, and then being active with the Merchants Association in Martinsville, and just being aware of what was happening uh, piqued my interest in things around the world and in our own community. And I think that's probably what got me first. Uh, then I met Senator Luger, and that fired my interest up, and that pretty well sums it up. Yeah, well, that's a pretty good summary of yeah. uh, some good folks. Yes. Paul, uh, you were starting off in the law enforcement age as a <coughs> dispatcher, is that correct? Uh, Mooresville. Yeah, Mooresville dispatcher. Yeah. And then you went from there to? Police officer up there for a year. And then from there? Sheriff's Department. That's deputy. A, you moved right up. Huh? You moved right up. Yeah, I guess so. Over <laughs> down one. <laughs> <laughs> well... We sure appreciate that. Uh, good service. People Thank recognize you. it right off the bat. Um, you all run for major county offices in 1970. What brought you to that decision? I know Jim, you had already stated why you did and everything, and so did Phil and Paul, but uh, did you guys know each other before that back? I don't think so. I might have met Paul somewhere along the line. I don't think I ever met Phil till we all got into this together, right. crossing paths, <clears throat> uh, trying to get elected. Uh, Paul and the sheriff at the time, Fred Neal. Fred had been a state police officer, but I had never met Fred, to my knowledge. And Paul and Fred were, let's say, instrumental in my winning the primary election in 1970. They've become great friends, great people. Bill, same question, sir. I did not know Jim prior to that. Uh, I had met Paul through my affiliation with the radio station, working with various news agencies and getting acquainted with the sheriff then, Fred Neal, and then later Paul. And I uh, soon came to respect him and found out he was a very highly well thought of, respected individual. Mm -hmm. And um, just being around him a lot piqued my interest, got me involved. Did you three all join together when you first started your political career? Or did you just go ahead and run basically on your own, it sounded like? I think we were running on our own. On your own. Just trying right. to survive and right. get enough <laughs> folks to uh, get the jobs that we all wanted at the time. Yeah. How's, the, um, how's the county changed since 1970? that you've seen? I mean, that's a pretty good sized question, but what have you seen happen in the last 50, 52 years in this county that kind of sticks out in your mind? I'll start with uh, Mayor. I think uh, seeing the county become more advanced um, due primarily to grants, the availability of uh, people getting more actively involved, uh, seeking ways to expand the county, which we have all uh, thought and often spoke outwardly. Uh, that there are many things we needed uh, lying here as a bedroom community. Uh, and I think that opened up a new pathway, a doorway, and uh, I've seen a lot of developments since 1970 in our county. Paul, what have you seen happen in the county 
uh, in the last 50 years? Oh, a bunch. Uh, population, <laughs> for one thing. Yeah. And uh, just uh, everything's changed. Uh, police agencies, police department, the way they do it. Courts. Yeah, I suppose there's a big change all over. Probably commissioner, too. <laughs> <laughs> Got to watch those guys. Yeah. Well, I'd like to, well, Jim, I want to, I'm going to come back on a question here, following this one up. Jim, what did, well, the, the county. I'm like Paul, the growth in population uh -huh. is, is evident to everybody. Uh, the traffic problems that come along with that. Those of us that live in the northern part of the county uh, realize that when you shut down 37, it all comes on to 67, that you got problems yeah. moving them through Mooresville. And, um, of course, that was, that's. Kind of disappeared now. They're back using 37, but um, just the little things, the little problems. Uh, probably no greater violent crime, uh, as far as numbers are concerned, but um, just the little things that come along with an increase in population. Now, I know this wasn't on the list of questions, but I'm, it comes to mind if you find out what it was. What do you see? Um, what what hasn't changed that you like? What hasn't changed? No, yeah, what ha what hasn't changed that you kind of glad it hadn't? I think in large measure, the people overall in Gordon County, I find that most people are pretty decent, that they're really not out trying to cause trouble, that um, they try to get along with one another, just trying to live, heck out of living in one way or another, they're trying to support their families, trying to get the benefits of um, uh, that you have with a, in a society that has greater wealth and so forth and all those things. Well, what what have you seen in it that you that you particularly like? That's I think I'd have to echo Jim's comments. I think it's the uh, attitude, behavior of most of the people uh, who are decent folks, and they're just good, down to earth folks. And I'm proud to be a part of them. How about you, Paul? What? what have you seen that was there 50 years ago that's still here? What? What have you? What do you see uh, in our county uh, that you're glad it's still with us? That's kind of a tough, tough question, but yeah. well, the people. I don't believe I understood the question. Yeah, I know. I was kind of a fumbler. <laughs> um, go back 52 years ago when you first got into politics, and we've talked about some of the things that changed, but what, is, what has stayed the same? What has stayed the same? There's sakes, I don't know. Probably nothing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, it's... Uh, <clears throat> Probably it, nothing. It is all changed. That's a fact. Except maybe the people. Yeah. We've still got some some folks that are even the new ones kind of rub we rub off on them, you know. Catching. Um, yeah. Go ahead, Kenny. Paul, oh, what was the biggest governmental event that happened while you were in office? Oh, do you want to want a fair governmental? I think uh we had an awful big drug raid here one time in 1974, thanks to Jim Harris, prosecutor. We uh, took about 80, I believe, right? one time, 75, 80, and I didn't have a jail. Uh, the jail was tore up being remodeled, and I didn't have a jail. Had uh, made arrangements through Marion County. They brought a bus down, loaded it. We had prisoners scattered everywhere. So next day, the court was in. We had to round all them people up and get them back to the county. What do you call it? Uh, biggest thing in the county, but it was pretty big at the time. Yeah, yes. yeah, I could see that being a, a handful resting on them people, moose, and not having nowhere to, to take them locally. That would be a problem. Phil, what, what's the biggest biggest event happened while you were in office? Well, I suppose um, for anything that pertained me or affected me, 
Uh, when I became clerk, we modernized uh, our election system after staying out all night with uh, Paul and Jim, uh, waiting to get our results. As a matter of fact, we wound up having breakfast in Paragon the next morning at 6 o'clock, and the tally was still not in. They were still counting balance. But uh, we convinced our county commissioners and council that it was time to uh, get modern, and we switched to the automatic voting machines, uh, the first ones that were made, as a matter of fact, manufactured in Jamestown, New York, and it took uh, a great deal of education and schooling, uh, and then uh, schooling for our voters, and we got everything changed from paper ballot to machine ballot, and that was that was a drastic change in Morgan County. Thank you for that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Biggest event where you were on the bench or as judge? Well, I um, when you think about big events, I'm inclined to think about cases and and you know over a career of uh, as long as I was on the bench, there were always cases popping up every three or four years here in the county, usually some violent crime murder type case that uh, really stand out. Uh, I think a lot of change in the county and things I've seen have been incremental. It hasn't been something just jumped out. You know, it's something that um, was um, brought up or somebody saw a problem and discussed it and worked on it and then incremental change. Have it done. About uh, this is kind of a tough one, but I see if you. I know you've looked it over before, but if you had to do it over, uh, what what decision would you change, if any? I don't know that I would uh, change anything offhand. Uh, I'm just a type, and I've always been taught you take every day as it comes and approach every situation the best you can. Uh, and I think that's still my philosophy today. Uh, I don't uh, know that I could change anything that's that would be within my power that would make a big difference. So. Paul, can you think of anything you would have wished you hadn't done? Yes. Uh, uh, I would have probably, if I had another decision, I had the decision to make over, I believe I would have run for another four years or so. I was a little bit too young when I quit, I was 55, and I had a lot of, I found out I've had a lot of life since then. <laughs> That's a blessing for us all, Paul. I've had a lot of life since then that I, I wasted and that I could have been sure of another four years. Well, I remember when I was out there uh, and, and visiting with you one time, I asked you, if you went, why didn't you run for commissioner? Now, I'd like to hear the answer to that. Do what? Why didn't they ever run for commissioner? Because you're about everything else. Oh, I know no part of commissioner. <laughs> <laughs> That's the only place I never wanted to go. <laughs> I wish you'd have changed that, Paul. You'd have been a great commissioner. <laughs> How about it, Jim? We, we kind of answered it, but uh, is there anything you would do different? No, of course, as a judge, you always think about cases. I know. But I was never one who tried to rethink a decision. You, you you learn as judge that the judge in our system probably knows less about the case than anybody else. Yeah. The prosecutor may have evidence that would make a considerable distance, uh, difference, but that's not admissible. Um, another party may have evidence that they don't want you to know, so therefore there's no testimony about that. If you started second-guessing decisions in that regard, then you have to change the factual information that comes before you, and there's no way that you can do that. So I never was one to uh, overthink decisions in, in that respect, although the cases that always bothered me as judges, of course, involving children. And um, for many years, as Matt Hansen is doing now, uh, I had virtually sole responsibility for the abuse and neglect cases within mm -hmm. the county. and. You always rethink those from the standpoint of wondering how things are going. Yeah. Whether the child is coming along in maybe a new environment or what's happened, you know, but there's no way of going back and changing it. Yeah. Thanks, Jim. What is something that being in politics taught you that you might not have learned otherwise? Higher? Well, I don't know, Kenny. I think um, I've always. Uh, operate under the philosophy that there are two sides of every story. 
but it's made me uh, more aware, more cognizant of the fact that we need to listen to someone, really. Uh, give them an opportunity to speak their piece and weigh very carefully what they're saying. Um, I, I think that's probably one thing I've had to deal with more than any others. Moose, is there anything that uh, do you've learned while being in politics that uh, something in politics taught you that you might not learn otherwise? I don't know of anything. Can't think of anything? No. Jim, is there anything uh, being on the bench or being prosecutor taught you that you might not have learned otherwise, sir? Well, me, we made a lot of changes in programming as far as the judiciary is concerned when I was a judge. And programs which are still going on today and have been very effective. But I think you'd learn in doing that that you can't talk to too many people. <laughs> that uh, particularly in politics, when you're having to sell it to a county council or commissioners or whoever, that you need to talk about it, consider their point of view, try to work <clears throat> together if you possibly can. Uh, the other thing is that um, you find out through <clears throat> politics that things are going to happen that you have no control of. Yeah. So have to, you just have to go with the flow. Yeah. I think that's particularly true today when you talk about the legislative branch and the rest of us, the executive yeah. and judiciary branches that are affected by what they do. And um, even though we sometimes, in my opinion, pretend that we have some control of that, I, I'm not convinced that we yeah. always do. Yeah. This is kind of a tough one in a way because you kind of got to I don't think brag, but you also have to realize that you guys were in office for many, many years. Uh, what do you think uh, or hope was the biggest legacy uh, to Morgan County and the people of our county that you left? Let's start with Jim. Got you. Well, I mentioned programs that we'd start as judge. Um, there's a CASA program which is Court Appointed Special Advocate. Um, we started the, I think, third or fourth one in the state, well beyond, well before uh, state government got involved by creating a statewide system of CASA volunteers. CASA being Court Appointed Special Advocates and their community volunteers who uh, agree to represent the interests of a child, uh, which is affected by the court system. The other thing is um, we started a unified probation department. Instead of each judge having their own little probation officer and so forth, we um, we started to create a unified probation department where you have a department that, that um, works with all the courts and all the judges. And now, uh, even though we started many years before the state went this way, virtually that's the way probation is done statewide in all 92 counties. Um, the other thing I had a feeling for that I just find that a lot of judges don't have is that we are talking about three branches of government and that sometimes you have to stand up for the judicial branch and other people don't want to do that. At one time I sued the county basically or the council over probation salaries and um, I would get the court um, uh, personnel salaries because I felt very strongly that they were ridiculously low and that these people deserve more. In all honesty, that turned into a statewide project. Things were done and, and probation and the courts and the population benefiting from that, that mm -hmm. um, step in ways that are unimaginable. That's, those are three great legacies, Judge. Um, Mayor, what do you think or hope would be the legacy of Phil Deckard. Well, I would hope that uh, people would remember him as one who had an open heart, an open mind. Uh, I was warned many times in my position against holding uh, public hearings, public panels, uh, but I found it's best to listen to people. Yes. Everyone has an idea, and everyone has a right to voice an opinion, uh, and we don't know what those are if we don't give them an ample time to speak out uh, in order, of course. Uh, and in an orderly fashion, but uh, I hope people will remember that I was one who uh, practiced fairness, 
always had an open door policy, uh, wanting them to know they could come to me at any time. Uh, as I've stressed to my children growing up, uh, we have to learn to listen, uh, to be able to agree to disagree, and uh, be able to forgive. That's the most important commandment from our Creator, uh, and then continue in our daily life. So, Thank you, Mayor. I hope I've left that. Well, that's a good one to leave. I think you have, Mayor. I think Thank you. you have. Thank you. Paul, oh, what's the legacy of Moose Mason in this county? you got a lot of things to pick from. Well, I don't know whether it's a lot of legacies, but the changes that I made when I was in the first office, I established the first merit board and, and pension plan, pension plan approved. And that's a couple of them. And uh, uh, then I started uh, another thing. Uh, what call the lady? What's her in? What I'm in the work release, jail corrections release. I understand that. Jail corrections work release. Well, we, it wasn't work release then, but we uh, I was using prisoners out to do work. Cleaning up uh, oh, along the road. Community corrections. Community corrections. Yeah. Uh, I, yeah. I, I, I started that. I uh, don't know. Well, I see right now you three gentlemen left a lot that we still <clears throat> revere, really. Yeah. Transparency, service, uh, a unified program and led the state. And I will say that our probation department as you probably recognize, I know uh, it still is ranked one of the top in the state. And um, you have a great deal to be proud of what you've given in the way of legacy. I appreciate it. Yes. Ken. Moose, I'm going to start with you. I know uh, you probably already answered it earlier, but would you do it all over again? It sounded like you would have by your answer earlier that you kind of yes, stopped. I, I'd have done everything over just the way that. <laughs> except for running one more term. What? I said, except for running one more term, it yeah. sounded like. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Bill? You know, I can't help but reflect on uh, uh, all the fun we've had getting to this position. And when I first started, I, I think back to the times that uh, in canvassing this county, first of all, I, I really learned how large our county was, and it's tripled in size now. But uh, everywhere I would go, I would learn of the respect and love these people had for Moose Mason, regardless of party politics. And the other thing I would learn, uh, I wonder who the guy was in a little yellow car. I was always following him. Jim Harris came to town with a bright little, I believe it was a Pinto, wasn't it, Jim? A Mustang. Mustang. And he was everywhere with a little yellow car. So I, I, I soon learned that I was in good company if I would stay in that trail. And uh, I think it worked out very well. I have the utmost respect for both of these gentlemen. You know, speaking of a little yellow car, just a little story. When my wife and I were discussing this a while ago. She brought up the little, little yellow car. And how that came about was that I resigned from the state police, as I mentioned, in order to run for prosecuting attorney. Well, of course, there went the police car that I'd been driving back and forth to law school for five years and all that, and I had to have a car. So I had somebody take me down to have to be Sharp Ford up on South 31, and they had this little yellow Mustang, and I bought that little yellow Mustang that later on my boys used, and and um, she was amazed because I didn't really discuss it with her in advance to the extent I probably should have. And then I went in there and bought this car, you know, and had no job. You know, they sold me this car and, you know, I had no money or job as a practical matter. And uh, so she brought that up and reminded me of that little yellow car. <laughs> That's good stuff. You know, you've kind of answered this question uh, in, a, in a different way, but um, can you just really, uh, we've talked about the value of the people and the, the goodness of it. Can you, what particular sticks in your mind is one of the best things about the folks? That most people are good and try to do the right thing. And we may not always 
agree with it. One of the examples I've used are verdicts and jury trials, yeah. where you have citizens come in and serve as jurors, and although I might have agreed, disagreed, excuse me, with their decision, uh, they were they always acted in good faith and were trying to do the right thing. Some the sometimes the right thing is a little inconsistent with the law, uh, <laughs> but they always attempted to do that, and. Um, uh, I, I think that um, <clears throat> the, the, the fairness of people, the willingness of people to serve and to do things for government, for their fellow citizens. I look at all the volunteer organizations and so forth that we have in the county and think of the number of people, whether it's cost of volunteers or whatever it might be, the number of people who have gotten involved and helped the rest of us who have had the privilege of serving government as officers. You know, I, I have to dovetail on that because I, um, when you were talking about porch time, this is my first exposure to it, but I think that's exactly what's led to the success of this, uh, this porch time. People and their willingness to be generous and be fair. Mayor? I'd echo again what Jim has said. I think it's the goodness and generosity uh, of the people. Uh, for the most part, their willingness to forgive and to, hey, let's sit down and look at this. I, I can't help but think when I first entered politics, I was active at the radio station in charge of advertising sales uh, on air uh, communications operator. And my opponent running for clerk the first time hired an attorney who immediately jumped on that and filed a lawsuit against me, uh, claiming we were violating the Fairness Act. Uh, which meant that I had to get off the air and lose my job, my payroll. Uh, and I'm, like Jim, I was unemployed there for a short time when the Superior Court Judge Noble Littell called me one day. And, and uh, he said, you know, my court reporter is much deserving of a vacation she hasn't been able to take <laughs> to Lou Watkins. Anyone he know if I'd be interested. And I said, well, I'm game to try most anything. So I came over and uh, very quickly uh, learned the basics. And I filled in for Tulu as court reporter. And then when it was time for her to come back, a long-term um, bailiff, Pete Wettstein, uh, also was entitled to a vacation. And the judge said, well, would you consider being the bailiff for a while? <laughs> sure. And I enjoyed that. That's where I became more acquainted with, with Paul Mason and Fred Neal and staff of the Sheriff's Department. But just things like that. And incidentally, that opponent of mine at that time, uh, now we're best friends. Uh, even prepares meals and brings them to my house during times of illness. <laughs> so it's just the uh, ability to forgive and to carry on and do what's best at the time. Yeah. It's a good thing Paul didn't need a bail or a <laughs> guard at the jail. You would probably. I would have done that too. <laughs> <clears throat> How about it, Paul? What? What's the best thing about folks here in the county? As we've kind of hit it before, but if what do you really like about things out there on West Union Road. Well, I like well, what? Where you live in this oh, county. It's fine. It's uh, open country, and I like that. Um, uh, it's uh, good uh, open country, and I, I like being in the country. And there's a lot of good people around. I have a lot of good neighbors, and it's just Morgan County's a fine place. Morgan County, and I think you could say a lot for Indiana in that same way. It's Hoosier, there's not, there, Hoosier hospitality is for sure a, a real thing. What? Being a Hoosier hospitality, you know, I think that's just probably a real good thing to be. Yeah. Yeah. Except when you click your pen, then you got problems. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <clears throat> you guys are paying. <laughs> Well, that's what we're thinking. We're thinking. <laughs> Sounds like my <laughs> wife. <laughs> there's, something, there's something we missed here. They, it's how the three of us really ended up together. Yeah. It was waiting for the returns all to come in as paper ballot back oh, then. Oh, yeah. And we was in a certain <laughs> courtroom together all night. Next morning, the three couples of us decided to go down to Perrigan for breakfast. We came back, and they still went all the way. And the returns were still in. So we, uh, we got together there, and 
course, I've known Jim when he's back state policeman. Yeah. <laughs> we got a little, little deal one time, and he and I was uh, took took shelter behind a yeah, tree. A tree. <laughs> whenever we looked around, really, that tree wasn't big enough for me. <laughs> but I think Jim was, Jim was taking cover behind me. <laughs> that wasn't for a big tree. <laughs> kind of a shootout situation. <laughs> Can I like, add a little bit? Yes, please. <laughs> I had occasion to go on good old good old Google a while ago to find out what the actual date was of the primary election in 1970. Okay. Because it was such a day in my life, and the biggest day in my life, except for, of course, Carolyn and boys and that sort of thing. But Paul and I, and his wife Carolyn, my wife Carolyn, had decided on that day that after we got done with the usual polling things, you know, passing out and passing out things and so forth at the polls, that we would meet at Gray's and have dinner and then go down to Martinville and listen to election results. And everything they've said about the results are true. But I'll add a couple of things to that. Um, my having not passed the bar exam become an issue in that campaign. And it's a valid issue by my opponent because I had um, graduated from law school in January, taken the bar in March. The results were supposed to be in by May the 1st, but they were not. Uh, I had approached <laughs> the lady in the, that handled all of that in the state house and I said, would you please give me a call and let me know if I pass the bar exam? hoping I would have that before election day. So we came home that day, and I went to the mailbox before I went into the house. There was a letter saying I'd passed the bar exam. Before we went to Martin, before we went to Gray's, uh, there were a couple precincts, or I think three precincts across, across the county that said that they would let me know let the public know what the results of the prosecutor's race were uh, in those three precincts, which was pretty representative of the county. And I'd won all three of those precincts. So then we met at Gray's, and later on, once you get out, went down to get the voting results, which, as they mentioned, was very slow back in those days. And, um, but it really became the biggest single day that changed my life, being the information that I'd passed the bar that I was elected prosecuting attorney because back then it was like Steve Songa. Now, if you get the primary uh, in your favor, then you're probably not going to have a Democrat running the poll. That's the way it was that year. It was a big day. It was a big day. I can see that would stick in your mind for whatever. Life changing. Life changing. <clears throat> well, you guys have um, changed Morgan County for the better. And we're de deeply, uh, Kenny and I and all these 70 other thousand people in this county are, um, I guess you'd say we're indebted very much. I, you got one final one, question. One last question, Judge. How would you like to be remembered? That I tried to be just and fair everything that I did. I'm sure I made mistakes. I'm sure there was the impact of some decisions that I've never heard about and have no knowledge of that you would hope have turned out different. But um, little things happen sometimes that make you think maybe you did the right thing most of the time. Um, I was at a you know, wedding event uh, up at Mooresville a month or so ago, and a guy came up to me and thanked me for my giving custody to his mother instead of his father. Something that simple. He must have been in his 40s or 50s. I won't mention his name. Paul Mason knows him well. And, um, and just little things like that or the times that's happened. And every now and then it will happen and somebody will come up and do that. Like I say, I'm sure that every decision I made didn't work out as well. But you try to do the right thing. Just hope and pray that it was.
Moose, how would you like to be remembered? Well, as a good sheriff, but I tried to do my best. I put my all in it, and as one of my kids to sit nowhere could tell that I was, I put most of my life in it, tried to do the best job I could. Uh, we thank you for that. I know me and Belita has talked about you, and uh, back then, the sheriff was a working sheriff back then. Not so administrative like it is today, but we really want to thank oh, you. Oh, I, I couldn't be sheriff sure today sitting in that office. <laughs> <laughs> no way. <laughs> I'd have to be out there. Yep. Yeah. Getting something for the prosecutor to do. <laughs> <laughs> Can I tell you a little Paul Mason story? Oh, yeah, we'd yeah. love to hear that. <laughs> Paul Mason had at that time. I don't know about now, had at that time the most phenomenal memory of anybody I ever met. He could go out and investigate a major crime and come in with a case report that consisted of what he could write on a matchbook cover and take the witness stand and testify for hours <laughs> about what he had down there. And I'm not sure his memory is as good now but it was a fantastic thing to watch if you was prosecutor back in those days. Well, there was a, there was a change between the prosecutors. Used to address somebody, and, and of course the uh, office is in the courthouse then next to the court. And sometime along the line, Richard Bray, who was prosecutor then, come through and I'd Tell him who arrested and what it's for and where it was at, and he'd leave, come back a little bit with a with a paper, and I sign it. It's all done, I'm ready to go to court. Then it changed the probable cause. <laughs> <laughs> we either had to have a probable cause affidavit or an oral probable probable cause uh, before a, a judge. And that, it's one thing, it hit me real hard right after, as soon as he was elected prosecutor. <laughs> we didn't, we didn't do things quite the same, but <laughs> anyway, we got her done. Well, Phil, how would you like to be remembered? I know everybody knows that you are fair and you are just, and I will say that I know you've always listened to me whenever I had a concern or anything. Well, I hope uh, <clears throat> I hope people remember me as one who was fair and just uh, and abided by the golden rule. I try to practice do unto others as you have them do unto you, uh, and I hope I'm remembered for that. Uh, that I was uh, protective of the county's funds and assets under my jurisdiction, and that uh, that open door policy always existed, whether on the job, at home, 24 hours a day. And I abide by that yet today, uh, much to my son's displeasure. He gets after Dad for answering the phone and running these errands, but that's part of me, and I appreciate people. I'm a people person. I enjoy uh, the camaraderie and, and getting together and, and uh, fellowshipping. Uh, we don't always agree, but again, agree to disagree, and then be friends. Go on. So. Well, one last thing. This is a family podcast, so I just got to ask, so <coughs> Moose, do you have anything on either one of these gentlemen you'd like to bring up like the judge did on you? You mean to bring up? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we don't want to get into that. <laughs> no, I don't think so. Phil? I don't think so. No, I don't dare. I don't dare. <laughs> oh, man, Jim was a good prosecutor and he was a good judge. I guess. Yes. All the way down the line. Two good men. I think all three of you are yeah. true gentlemen and great yeah. guys. Greatly appreciate you and love the opportunity to get to meet you. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you. My pleasure. I so I didn't get to work too much with Phil. He was just in the clerk's office. Yeah. I followed him in the clerk's office yeah. and he went out after me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, most of these guys, their reports of probable cause on a typewriter with 
carbon copies too. Oh, <laughs> there was no computers back then. I talked to Paul about that. Go through the questions that are up. Oh, that's you want me to do that? Mm -hmm. uh, I'll scroll down through here. Lots, lots of good comments, lots of love coming from all sorts of people in the county. Um, I'll hit a miss. Love you, Papa. Great crew tonight from Portside. That was from Shauna. Um, I hope I didn't go too far. If I missed something up at the top, Beth, let me know. Uh, Randy Harris, that's a great memory. I remember Dad leaving in the middle of the night. I think that was we were talking about uh, counting ballots. Um, Michaela, Michaela would yeah. Michaela would like to ask her Papa Phil, how hard has it been doing all the important roles you have been in? Difficult, but I've always had a lot of good help. That got me through it. Good grandchildren, good children, and my advisor, my son. So made it made it easier. Mike Minty, thank you for your service, Morgan County government. Thank you for your service. Um, let's see, Jeremy Toomey, thank you for your service. Nice seeing the recognition, and you guys are all still around. Uh, Corey Baker, thank you all for your service, Morgan County. So much deserved recognition in studio tonight. Tanya, thank you for all you have done for Morgan County. One day there will be a show like this about Valida. And I agree. <laughs> Cheryl Aubrey, love seeing these great folks. Love my hometown. Tori, Tori Franker, I may have missed this question. I apologize if I did. What led each of them to become individual, or excuse me, what led each of them to become involved in county politics? What was the deciding factor for you guys to step in to sheriff, mayor, and judge? Well, as I mentioned before, mine um, was to get a job. <laughs> uh, and my desire to be prosecuting attorney. Uh, I had experienced um, in my state police career uh, prosecuting attorneys that, um, let's say, left a little bit to be desired. Back in those years, uh, the prosecutor's job in probably three-fourths of the state, two-thirds of the state, was a part-time job. It became just a, a, a little part of um, your being a lawyer, and most prosecutor's offices were in uh, the lawyer's office um, that was elected prosecutor. In fact, Morgan County was that way at the time I became prosecutor. The, the law changed in, uh, I believe, 1973, maybe, or something where a county the size of Morgan, the prosecutor could elect, could elect to be a full-time prosecutor. Uh, if he did, he could not practice laws for civil cases, so forth are concerned. So uh, that's my response. Phil? Mr. Burning, desire to get involved and in, uh, perhaps in a position where I could be of greater influence to a greater number of people. Mr. Mason, what led you to get into politics or sheriff's department? I was, a, I was deputy sheriff for eight years, and Fred Neal's term was uh, ending. I had no idea or thoughts of being sheriff or running for sheriff, and just never had it. And uh, one day, uh, Fred and I, Fred Neal, who was sheriff, and I, and uh, Richard Bray was uh, uh, having a little powwow there in the courthouse when uh, it was about the end, uh, Fred was ending with his over two terms. Uh, his eight years, and they mentioned it to me. Would you run? You go run for sheriff? And I, no, I never really gave it a thought, but I did. <laughs> I was kind of prompted in by Fred and Richard Bray running. It's a good decision. Uh, Caleb. This has been a great show. Growing up and hearing stories and living through a good portion of Papaw serving the community, this show is allowing my kiddos to step back in time and see amazing leaders. Sharon, if someone was thinking about moving to Morgan County, what is the one thing you would say to convince them to move here? If someone was moving in, wanting to move to Morgan County, what would you gentlemen say to them to convince them to move here? It's just a great community, uh, close to so many avenues. Indianapolis to the north, Bloomington to the south. Uh, centrally located, great country, beautiful country, uh, and just the hospitality of of the population in general would be an enticement. 
Judge, you want to expand on that or? Well, one thing I would coverage? say is that you can move to Morgan County and government is in good hands. I firmly believe, um, uh, and it's my experience over the years, that it's not just because it's a Republican county. Now, it really has nothing to do with it, in my opinion. It has a lot to do with the quality of people who are willing to run and what they're willing to do uh, in that capacity, whatever it might be. And that overall, we've had a wonderful experience in the 50 years I've been around here, a wonderful experience about the quality of people who weren't were willing to take the time and make the effort to get elected to these very important local offices. Mr. Mason? I was not familiar with your question, I'm sorry. If someone was wanting to move to Morgan County, what's the one thing you would say to them to convince them to move into county? Oh, uh, there's a... What's our best attribute? Morgan County is just a good good rural county that that uh, has a lot of fine people in it. Uh, it's just a good place to live. Have good, uh, we have good office holders all the way through, and it, it's a good place to come to to live. Cheryl says, great folks who have served our, served our community with great pride and leadership for many years. Let me, let me skip that or keep going, Phil, right here. Felicia, so many memories following Dad and those men as they campaigned through the county. My mom was pregnant with her little sister. That's uh, that has to be my daughter. Yeah, <laughs> Lisa. Isn't that awesome? January 1971 saw Dad take office, and Rod Allen was born with a few days later. That is awesome stuff, there, Phil. Uh, Lisa Lambert, I can remember as a kid passing out flyers for Mr. Harris on Election Day. <laughs> Marion O'Neill was another great guy during those years. He yes. always kept a bag of wintergreen candies to pass out as we <laughs> walked and passed out camping material. Uh, Tori says, Mr. Mason still has that fond memory, or that, that good memory. Uh, Mike Minty says, all three great men. Greg Swinney says, I appreciate and admire every person on there tonight. Uh, Heather Lynn says you're, she's your biggest fan, Phil. Uh, Jenny, we need more people today following the example of these great public servants. I would agree with that. Um, how did you get things done without cell phones and computers? <laughs> yes. With, with all the technology we have now, <clears throat> I think it would shock a lot of young folks. How did you guys get things, things accomplished back in the day? Well, you just use the tools that you had. It just took longer to do it, and you didn't do it as well. I mean, we keep more records. They talk about a paper of society. I, I suggest that we got more paper out there now than we ever had before <laughs> because there's records and so forth being kept that just so much better than what they were back in those years. You just simply didn't have time. Uh, when you're talking about, uh, like someone mentioned, three carbon copies and so forth and a typewriter. Right. And yeah. uh, I can remember my court reporter, Beth Farr, the first time we talked about getting computers, literally saying, I'm never going to learn, you know, using that computer and so forth. Well, she did, uh, and, and she did it extremely well. And um, she would never give up the computer once she learned to use it. And I don't think anybody else would today. Right. But you, um, you just simply didn't do it as well then as you do now, or as complete as you would do now. Phil, you want to hit on that or no? I agree with that. Yeah. We just had to make do with what we had. Mr. Mason? Yes. How did you guys get, how, you want to expand on that at all? How did you guys get everything accomplished? Or did the judge cover it? How did you guys get everything accomplished back in the day without all this technology we have today? Oh. Or did the judge cover it good enough there? I'd hate to start with all this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> we had a radio, that was enough. I didn't uh, I don't know what we'd have done with it if we had it. Uh, I was just happy without it. A lot of technology out there that I ain't sure it's good. Right. Let me scroll down here a little ways. Um hope I didn't miss 
think Beth is the next question. Um, what is the best and worst thing that happened in the county during your time in politics? Judge, you want to start with that one? Well, the worst thing that I can remember happening is the um, Stephen Judy case where he killed um, a mother and what was it, three children, three two children. or three children yeah. by yeah. drowning here in the county after picking them up on the interstate when she had car trouble, I believe. Uh, it was also probably the first death penalty case to go to trial after a hiatus of 15 or 20 years that uh, we didn't really have the death penalty applicable to uh, the state of Indiana. And that's certainly the worst case. Uh, I don't know. I think there's a lot of highlights when you look back at what's been accomplished in the county. You know, one time, uh, if somebody asked me about uh, Morgan County and government, I would have said maybe most conservative county in the state. And I believe that at the time. I see things happening now that I think put us right in the forefront of of doing things and trying to accomplish things and um, do them as well as we can. And less conservative in that regards. I think maybe just as conservative as far as the use of money is concerned. It just takes more money to do more things. Right. Mr. Mason? What is the best and worst things that happened in the county? That's the question. Yes, sir. Hard one. I don't know. Uh, the, uh, what Jim mentioned about state duty case was one of the worst, I think. And one of the best, I'm not sure. I think one of our best is getting you three elected and into the positions that you that you yes. ended up in. What? I think getting you three gentlemen into the positions that you ended up in was a pretty good deal for our county. Well, we hope we've done some good in the county and done the best we could anyway. Phil, you want to expand on anything? Well, I think uh, <clears throat> looking back, Mooresville and Martinsville particularly, uh, the advancement of the grant process that opened up the door to many improvements that had been long overdue. Uh, I think that's been one of the best things that happened to our county, affecting all communities, not just Mooresville and Martinsville, but uh, the branching off from those two. Uh, I think we're seeing many things that should have happened several years ago and uh, couldn't for a number of reasons, primarily money. Uh, with the assistance now of the federal government, we've been able to expand our streets, sidewalks, our highways, uh, going through a lot of inconveniences during all this, um, but the end result is what we're looking for, and we're seeing a lot of that now come to fruition, uh, and I think that's, uh, that's some of the best things I can look back at. Cheryl says, awesome show, bring back many, brings back many wonderful memories. God bless each one of you. And then another question from Beth. I heard we had some gel breaks back then. Can anyone like to discuss that? Did we have some gel breaks back in the day, Mr. Mason? What? Did we have some gel breaks back in the day? Oh, yes. yes. <laughs> would, would you like to what a common <laughs> thing. discuss some of those? <laughs> yes, we did. We had, uh, I don't know, three or four. There was one that uh, Lita's dad was involved in that they gave his turnkey, and they, uh, I believe they ended up locking him up, if I remember. And two got away that, and three got away that night. We got two of them in the county. With the, I rode around the state police helicopter looking for them. We got two of them up north. And uh, the other one got down to Kentucky, I think, before we got him. But one one night we had five. We had a guy that had uh, uh, broke into the Monroe Bank. And uh, he got as far as Mooresville, and Mooresville police uh, chased him into Waverly. That's when you get to Waverly. <laughs> and, uh, mm -hmm. and he banded his car. They did, I believe it was two of them. And we got him uh, the next day at a... In a, in a guy's garage, they pulled in from work, and he was in his garage. And that's how we got him, Donald Barnes Bradley, and never forget his name. And he, there was five left in, and it took a little while, but we had got them all back except him. And he ended up getting arrested down Louisville, and he had uh, 
uh, so many charges against him down there. We never did get him back. Bad <laughs> 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 one. He's the one that he's the one that instigated the jailbreak. Mm. Now, that's a couple I can think about. And there's uh, there's been other jailbreaks, but I the ones that comes to my mind right now. Well, thank you, sir. Phil or Judge, anything to say on that? No. Tanya wanted to know, uh, sorry if I missed this question, did any of you work at the old jail with Valita's dad? So that would that would be a yes. <laughs> yeah. And I worked with him through the clerk's office. Okay. Running papers for the sheriff and great man. Great man. Oh, I missed one? Um, how far up, Beth? Okay, what wishes do you have for the county in the future? Bill, let's start with you. What do you open for the county in the future? I'd like to see the uh, continuation of expansion development that we're experiencing now. Uh, I'd like to see it more evenly dispersed, um, but I think that's only going to make our county living conditions everything in general better uh, with the expansion and new addition, new development, new businesses. Uh, I'm looking forward to that. Mr. Mason. I'm not, I didn't get the question. What are you, let me make sure you're with, what wishes do you have for the county moving forward? What would you like to see in the county moving forward? I'm sorry. What wishes do you have for the county moving forward in the future? What wishes do yeah. they have for oh, oh that it uh, keeps going and got the same uh, people think the same thing in the county that would move in here and know what kind of county it was and uh, I don't really know other than that. But... Judge, well, I'm not sure we need to sit here and dream up issues and things because I think they're going to come to us whether we're ready or not because of I-69. Right. I think we're going to see changes economically and, and issues and problem-wise that it's hard to envision until you actually experience. Uh, I do find that the county is probably, I remember many years ago when they remodeled the courthouse and I was having a conversation with the contractor, just one of those things over lunch that we were chit-chatting. And um, he said at the time, he said, uh, the issue was in regards to remodeling a historic building or tearing it down and starting anew. Now we're back to that same issue, by the way, but, but that's been 40 years ago. And he said that that there's nothing wrong with remodeling old buildings or adding on to them and so forth, as long as you realize that you're going to have more problems that just come about because of old age of buildings and you don't always foresee. And that's been the experience. And you can and you can sit here and dream up issues, but they're going to come to you. And government is not very proactive. It's reactive in most cases. Uh, but um, I think, and from my advantage point now as a citizen, like so many others in the county, uh, I think we're capable of um, looking at those issues and overcoming them, whatever it's going to take to do that. But um, we don't have to create problems on our own here by imagination because I think that we're going to see them right. out there on the streets and highways in a variety of different ways, some of which are good, of course. I think the economic development that's going to occur is um, is great, but um, there's other problems that's going to come along with it that um, are not going to be as easy as you can find. Thank you, Judge. Uh, Aaron Fraker, I want to thank each of you for all the hard work you have done for our county. Grandpa, thank you for inspiring Charlie and I to continue to help the citizens. You make us very proud. Uh, this is for Paul and Jim. Law enforcement now carries semi-automatic semi weapons. What did you carry when you first started your careers? Hey, uh, I carried a thirty-eight revolver. 
38 revolver. Still got it. <laughs> <laughs> now they have Glocks that big. Uh, well, we, had a, we had a shotgun in the car, too. Other than that, there's just a 38 revolver we carry. And, uh, we had, uh, when I started, there was three of us, two deputies and the sheriff's over was in the county then. And uh, we had two cars. So we just had to <laughs> take somebody home or switch back and forth on the cars. And finally, uh, Fred was able to get a third car by not trading, just buying outright, bought a third car. But then come along a third deputy, hired a third deputy, and then he's back in the same <laughs> same situation. Rotating seats, yeah. yeah. But after I was uh, uh, elected sheriff, uh, in order to get uh, a deputy, each, each deputy a car, uh, I was buying used state police cars <laughs> and painting them uh, to, to sheriff's color. Yeah. So we all had a car, and that was probably, I had probably had three, four deputies maybe then. And that's the way, and, and I run that, run that way my entire two terms, that's the way I was getting oh. cars. We had some cheap fleets of pop people in office back then. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> Judge, what about you during the Indiana <clears throat> State Police days? What was your... <clears throat> The Indiana, the, um, uh, the Indiana State Police at that time issued um, Smith & Wesson 38 revolvers, like all back revolvers. Okay. Uh, let's see. Okay. Uh, Aaron Fraker, ditto, even inspiring his great-grandkids. Love you, Papa Mason. So you got a lot of love out there. That, that's all I've got on here. Anybody else got any questions? Belita? Beth? Jim? Anything? I, I, I'll say something. Any that other questions? When, when, when we started this, when we discussed this off air a little bit before we got rolling, I always say that we, we're able to do what we do for the people because of the people of this community. And it started with three individuals, like it, it probably before the next generation, before you gentlemen too. But you guys carried that banner on, and and took it to the next generation of people, of good people in this community. We always make the point that there's not too many towns doing what we're doing on a Sunday night, raising money for someone in a time of need. And and all three of you hit on that, how good the people are in this community. But our influences are you guys, and when they're men of honor and character like you three, that's going to rub off on us. And so it's a natural fit, and it, and it what you did for us, we are we deeply appreciate all three of you. Thank you, Kevin. We commend you too for your thoughts and ideas, and the ability to forward an idea that you did have, and you fostered it now into something great. Thank you, sir. Great service. Lita? Oh, there's another question. <laughs> what happened in the alley with your 38 pistol and FBI agent, Julie, is asking that? What was the question? What happened in the alley with your 38 and the FBI agent? <laughs> Who knew about that? <laughs> that's, a, that's Julie Mason, it looks like, up there asking that. Well... Me and an FBI agent was uh, trying to arrest a guy, and he took off down the alley. And uh, the agent, he couldn't run after him, couldn't chase him, because he had a cow step on his foot the day before. <laughs> <laughs> and I was too big to run. <laughs> so I was had a wampus across there, and I thought, well, I'll fire, fire around out there and stop him. Well, I fired around, and it went up. <laughs> But he stopped. <laughs> I, I held that gun on that guy. Well, his agent was accompanying him, and uh, uh, 
Uh, I know I couldn't shoot another round if I had to. I had one in the barrel. I went down to jail and punched it out. And old lamination. <laughs> we didn't spend much money back then. Right. <laughs> Um, <clears throat> Seth Ringer, um, Paul, my father Brian worked for you, and I always heard you were the best man. And thank you for your service, sir. That was Seth Ringer. Brian was his dad. Who was that? Seth Ringer, Brian Ringer's son. Oh, okay. All right. Belita, you want to step in here for a minute and. Just whatever else to say. I wanted to say thank you. Well, come on down here. I'll get up. Or... I, don't, I don't want to talk. I can listen to stories on, online. I know. This needs to be a, a four-hour show on a Saturday right. afternoon. We can... Paul told me about a fight. They picked up prisoners at one of the prisons, I think, and you and Gene Groves ended on the ground outside of the... Oh, at the stoplight? Oh, well, I, was, I partner got my <laughs> everlasting that day. <laughs> yeah. You want me to tell about it? Yeah. Um, yes. We was uh, transporting, we shouldn't have been doing it, but we were transporting four prisoners back from Michigan City. So we had a trial for one, and the, and the other guy the other said that there was going to be witnesses for him, so they got a court order for us to bring him other three down also, which was too many, but we had them all shackled up in the back seat. Every one of them had leg shackles, and not all of them had leg shackles. All of them had a belt and, and shackled up in front. Everything was fine till we got down. Uh, we cut through Brownsburg because I'd made arrangements to leave them three at Plainfield, because I had a sneaking hunch they were only coming to down to try to make a break. So everything went fine till we pulled into Brownsburg and had to stop at the stop sign. And the two on the outside, both have come out of their cuffs, and one of them come over my side for my gun, and the other one went over uh, Gene's back, and Gene went out of the car on uh, on the pavement fighting with him, and I had a fight with mine, and they had this arm drug back behind the seat, and he just we were just fighting over that gun, and uh, he was trying to get her too bad, but I don't know what happened, but this uh, guy that I was fighting with just fell back in the seat, and he had blood running down his head. And I don't remember ever hitting him, but I might have. <laughs> but anyway, he, he fell back, and then and, and Gene and, uh, uh, was still fighting outside on the ground, and I was on my knees as the door opened, and I, the only time I had thoughts in my mind to kill a man, and that's, I had them thoughts. And I come off on there pulling, and getting him, and about that time I thought, well, Gene, they may switch, and I'd hit Gene. So that's the only thing that kept me from shooting that man. Wow. And uh, anyway, we got them all. Brownsburg police showed up about then, and we got them all back and shackled up, and three of them down to Plainfield, and then we went on to jail with the third one. He, he got life, and... Uh, that we brought back, and there was one we bring back was doing life, and two of them doing 10 to 25, and they was all bad apples, and we knew it, but probably shouldn't have been holding them all, but it's a long way from Michigan City. Uh, David Rogers wants to know, what was it like living in the old jail? What was it like what? Living in the old jail. Living in the old jail. Yeah. <laughs> we'll ask Debbie that. <laughs> she was growing up in the old jail. Well, I didn't think it was too bad because I didn't spend much time there. But, uh, it was on my family. It wasn't good for my family. And Carolyn cooked for all the prisoners. And uh, 
It was just not too good life for family, but I didn't mind it. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Butch told me some stories about that, too. What? Butch told us some stories yeah, about that. Butch, Butch uh, he would have probably run off if we'd lived there much longer. <laughs> he didn't like it. He didn't like it. Um, you were sheriff when Tommy Dunningan got killed, right? Our deputy? <clears throat> yes. Our reserve. I was thinking, um, was that a bank robbery at Waverly? Was Waverly yes. open then? Yes. Was yes. you judge of that? No, I, I was prosecuting attorney. You prosecuted uh, it that? It happened on uh, either last day or next to last day that I was prosecuting attorney. And really? And then I was going to be judge on January the 1st. I think it happened on December, I think it was right after Christmas, somewhere after Christmas but before the New Year. And um, I was um, probably one of the very few people to see Tommy after that accident. But... Um, I had also had the privilege of hiring his daughter a few years later as a probation officer. He's now married to Richard Bray, or um, Rob Bray. Just a wonderful lady. Mm -hmm. And um, so, you know, you kind of go full circle sometimes. Mm -hmm. And you really don't expect that the time you're involved in something as prosecuting an attorney involving the death of a police officer, um, getting an opportunity of Meeting his daughter and hiring his daughter and watching her, watching her grow, and, and she's like I say, just a wonderful thing for the county. At one time, she was uh, <clears throat> the director of the CASA program, mm -hmm. and I think she still does some of that. I but think she, she does. Uh, so you didn't people. get to prosecute him then? I no, said, actually, I turned actually outside of the day it happened and so forth, and my involvement then, I turned the case over to. Uh, Tom Gregg, oh, okay. who I knew was going to be, in fact, already been, he had already been appointed as prosecutor to follow me since I was resigned to take the judgeship. So I called Tom and literally gave the case to him because I felt since he was going to be the one to try it, that he should be doing it in on the case and kind of right front door of it. I remember that day very well. Then all of the deputies and as well as the police officers, state police, city police, uh, we're in a massive manhunt <clears throat> trying to find the fellow that caused the problem, and we stopped in the jail. <coughs> Pardon me. And my wife and I were uh, drafted into helping Gene dispatch that day because calls were coming in from all over the country, and we had news media arriving from everywhere. It was a, uh, a sad but large event. You You were on vacation, weren't you? You had no, to come back from vacation. A, uh, one day, uh, two days, I guess, what the plan was, me, me and Carolyn and another couple took a bus to Nashville, Tennessee uh, to see Grandpa Whopper or something. Anyway, uh, I was pulled in with the bus, and a guy come aboard and, and called me out and wanted me to make a home, phone call to home. So I made a phone call to home, and Debbie uh, told me the story. So we uh, got another bus and headed back to Indiana, getting back about midnight that night. And I was involved in all the rest of it, but uh, and all the trips over to where he was tried at. Where was that? Where were they trying at? Uh, Greenfield. Hancock uh, County. Uh, made a lot of trips over there with, uh, with Tom Gray, who was prosecutor then. Well, thank you so much. And John Adams is in charge of the Bicentennial Committee, and we got, we're got we going to have the big finale at uh, Waverly at our festival in September. <coughs> but we thank you, and we're it's a privilege to get to talk to all of you in one room, and you're not arrested. or prosecuting us or filing clerk papers on us. That's <laughs> divorce papers or something, Phil, we'd be passing those out. So, <laughs> so, but thank you so much. And it's been an honor to 
in my career to work with all of you. I asked Paul when I interviewed him, I said, and did you have any female deputies when you were sheriff? What did you tell me? Do you remember? <laughs> I don't remember telling you. <laughs> he said, female deputy, what's that? I never, <laughs> I never heard. One such thing until you. <laughs> 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 Different but, times. Yeah, yes. we've come.